to celebrate the birthday of the publication of May West autobiography on September 28, 1959, I will read you an extract from the book. I'm French, so as Mademoiselle Fifi said in Every Day is a Holiday, pardon my English, she's not so good. The extract I have chosen is her recollection of her first steps on Broadway in À la Broadway, which opened on September 22, 1911. I hope you enjoy. By 1911, I had sung and danced on vaudeville tours. Now I wanted to try out in New York City myself. I appeared at a Sunday night concert on Broadway at the Columbia Theatre, singing and dancing my best numbers on a program with many new acts. At these Sunday night shows, the United Bookings Office would be represented to catch new acts, and there would also be Broadway producers looking for new talent. It was the first time New York saw me as a single, and I tried to sing and dance the place down. The great Florence Ziegfeld, looking anything but glamorous, was there that night, and so was the well-known revue producers and director Ned Weyburn, a large, wise-looking man. Both sent me word they would like to see me. I went to see Ziegfeld. He had a fine show on the New York roof, and he said he wanted me in it. But I didn't like this type of theater. It's too big, too white. There isn't much chance for a personality. I need people close to me. Tell me, what's wrong with my roof for you? I'm thinking of myself and how I would appear on your stage. I wouldn't be working alone on stage. I wouldn't be seen to my best advantage by the entire audience at the same time. People on one side of the orchestra floor wouldn't be able to see what was happening on the other side of the stage. The entire effect of my personality depends on the audience being able to see my facial expressions, gesture, slow, lazy comic mannerism to hear me properly. You intrigue me, Miss West. If you ever put the Follies into another theater, I'd be glad to work for you. I wasn't bluffing, I was bold and brazen, but I knew I'd be a fool to play a stage not right for me, and I had impressed Sickfield. Come up to my theater, Miss West, during the day when no one is there and try the stage. Perhaps you'll get used to the place. I said I would, but I didn't mean it. I went to see Ned Weyburn. Weyburn congratulated me on my act. I may want you for my new show. What theater would the show go into? The Fulton Theater on West 46th Street. Why? Could I see the theater? Sure, if you wish. I'll be right back and let you know. He looked a little mystified. This is a new one on me, Miss West, previewing a theater. What till you get to know me better? At the Fulton Theater, a porter was cleaning up and the door were open. I went in and looked the place over. It had gilded balconies and deep red boxes that hugged the stage. It was intimate and the type of theater I used to working in when I was a child actress with a stock company. I went back to Ned Weyburn's office and told him, the theater is fine and I'll be in your show. Well, I better take you before you inspect the city. Being in a big Broadway show would pay a good salary, yet I was more interested in what my part would be like, what material what kind of songs I would do. Weyburn gave me a part to read. I looked through it and said, it's a good part, but I'd like to change a few things in it. We'll talk about it at rehearsal. I looked over the two songs Weyburn had for me. They were both good. One of them, they are Irish, I liked especially. This song I was to do with the two top comedians, Cook and Lawrence, a vaudeville team that also appeared in Musical Revue, in a scene in which they appeared as comedy plumbers. The song only had a verse and a chorus. There was a lot to be rehearsed in this show, and the comics were having difficulty with their props, their plumbers friends, a rubber tool that didn't sound loud enough. They never got to rehearse the song with me, but spent their time with a prop bathroom fixture. In the second week of rehearsal, I went to Ned Weyburn. Don't we ever rehearse? Yes, we will have to get to that. But we didn't. The complications with the water pipes kept on. I rehearsed the song by myself. It needed extra choruses. I knew if I waited until the writers got around to it, there wouldn't be time to learn them. We were getting closer to the opening and a comic was injured by a prop bathroom fixture. 
I took it upon myself to write two choruses for They Are Irish and got a songwriter to write three more. It didn't tell the producer, Paul Man, he had so much to do. I didn't rehearse at the theater. I went to a music publisher's office and rehearsed there. The Pumbler comic Cook and Lawrence never did get to rehearse the song with me. The nearest thing was a brief run through of one verse and chorus. Dear, it's great. Wait till you see our blowtorch beat, they said. We've decided just to use the song as an entrance number for you. It was a good time to play them, and I did. They were going to be more surprises than a blowtorch. The Ned Wayburn Revue, called A la Broadway and Hello Paris, was beautifully mounted and gorgeously costumed. It opened September 22, 1911. I was an unknown, and this worried Mr. Jesse Lasky, a trumpet player from vaudeville, then one of the big producers. Later, he became head of Paramount Studios, but just then I was his only big problem. During rehearsals, I didn't show up too well. He wondered whether I was able to carry the part, but Ned Wayburn had confidence in me, and I had plenty of confidence in myself. I could hardly wait until opening night to get out there and get at that audience before Mr. Lasky got at me and said, you're out. Opening night was wild and confusing. My first scene was in a spectacular military setting with an ensemble of 12 boys and 12 girls in magnificent uniforms behind me doing a military drill number. At the end of the number, they would stand at attention for my entrance. I was to do the song now without the comedians, Cook and Lawrence. At the dress rehearsal, Ned Wayburn had said, if you should happen to get an anchor opening night, what will you do? I have an extra chorus ready for. They are Irish. Just tell the conductor to play the chorus again in the same tempo. When did we get an extra chorus? You've been... Very busy, Mr. W. So, as soon as the military nonsense stopped, I poured on stage and went to work. I never stopped. I took seven encores. After that number, every time I came on stage, I got a wild, tremendous reception. Mr. Wayburn smiled and Mr. Lasky polished his glasses in a daze and decided he liked me after all. No one had much faith in the song until opening night, but I knew that a good dialect song with English, Dutch, Italian, Jewish or Irish overtones never failed in those days of early immigration. The song gave me an opportunity to do each extra choruses in a different dialect. I used all the stage tricks I had learned in stock training and vaudeville experience. I got the top notices of the show. Critics loved to discover somebody the audience didn't know before. The producers were delighted. Ned Wayburn congratulated me, smiled at me and shook his head. I don't remember any of those choruses. My other song, Ragtime, was a production number, the Philadelphia Drag, and I did eccentric and acrobatic dancing. It was also a showstopper. The author of the show was William Le Baron, a Broadway writer. He had written a scene in which I played a maid planted in the home of a wealthy family by a writer so that she could take notes on how the family lived and acted what their manners and habits were. It was to have been a young Irish maid, but not me. I played it as a flip, fresh, lazy character who acted as a maid student. I got a lot of laugh, and this also turned out to be good for the show. After the opening night, Bill LeBaron came backstage and put his arms around me. You certainly surprised everyone tonight, got your own music and rewrote my Irish maid. Anything else you want to change? I'm too tired to climb onto the roof and put my nape up in light. The next time I met Bill LeBaron was in 1932 in Hollywood. William LeBaron was to be the producer of some of my best pictures. The next day, the stage manager changed my dressing room. I had shared one on the second floor with two other girls. Now I had part of a star's dressing room. I shared it with Minerva Coverdale, an amusing Broadway musical star. As soon as I got to the theater, the chorus girls and boys, shrill and flip, crowded around me and read me the reviews. You received the best notices above everyone else in the show, May. Well, let's not get carried away. But they were good notices. New York Herald, 
There were some shining lights in the cast, notably Miss Mae West, who played the part of a wise flip maid. She danced in Turkish harem trousers in a most energetic, amusing and carefree manner. The New York Times. Again, there was some color and pretty movement in a continental march by the chorus and a girl named Mae West. It there too, unknown, pleased by her grotesquerie and a snappy way of singing and dancing. The New York Sun. Miss Mae West had a song or two that went pretty well, and she danced with considerable grace and originality. And the New York Tribune. Mae West, as Maggie O'Hara, really put a little newness into her ragtime songs. She has a bit of a sense of nonsense, which is the very latest addition to wit.